Before we go into more detail of the economic logic underlying the law of supply, we need to define a few important things. And the most important thing that we're going to define right now is what's known as market structure. So market structure simply describes the makeup of buyers and sellers in a particular market. So you take a, a specific market, let's say again, the market for gasoline in the Twin Cities area. And you have to, when you define the market structure, you have to define both the seller side and the buyer side of that market. So you have to ask yourself, how many sellers are there in the market? In this case, how many gasoline stations are there um, in the Twin Cities and how many refineries sell to those gasoline stations? Do they sell identical products or are things different? Uh, do consumers care which firm they go to to buy from? For the most part with gasoline, you don't really care which one of the gas stations you pull up to go into if your only objective is to purchase gasoline. Versus if you're in the market for clothing, you very much care which store you're walking into because that's going to determine the quality um, and the different features of the clothing that you're interested in buying. Third, you have to ask yourself if any one firm is able to change the price that consumers pay while all the other firms continue to charge, say, a lower price. On the buyer side, you have to ask how many buyers are there and whether any buyer can negotiate prices. Are you able to walk up to the um, clerk at one particular store and say, look, I noticed you listed the price here. I'm not willing to pay that. I would like to actually pay a lower price. And all the answer to all of these questions helps us determine what the specific type of market structure is. And for now in this class, we're going to focus on a perfectly competitive model um, of market structure. And in perfectly competitive markets, there are many, many buyers and sellers. And so what this means is that there are no dominant firms. So you, as the buyer, can't walk up to your gasoline station clerk and say, look, I noticed out on the sign outside you, it says today that gasoline is $199. I'd rather pay $150. If they tell, if you try that in the Twin Cities, they're most likely going to laugh at you and you're not going to be able to buy any gasoline. So you have to take prices as they are. And sellers also have to take prices as they are. And so sell, neither sellers nor buyers can influence the market price and firms in perfectly competitive markets are selling identical products. So again, with gasoline, you don't care who you sell, who you buy from. So what I have here is a map and an example of all of the different um, gas stations that are near McAllister. So McAllister's right located right around here. And you can see, you know, within about a five, 10 mile radius, all the different gas stations that you could go to if you were deciding who to fill up for right now, from right now. And what we want to consider is this um, particular assumption that says neither buyers nor sellers can influence market prices. So we just went through, if you go into any one of these gas stations, I don't recommend it, but you could, and ask them to lower the price for you, you, you won't be able to do that. Now let's consider the seller price, and let's look at this particular gas station here, which is a Sinclair gas station, which is really close to campus. And let's suppose that this Sinclair gas station decides um, to charge a higher price than every other station in St. Paul, and think about what's going to happen. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that drivers just aren't going to go there. Instead, they're going to drive another block or two and go to the Speedway on Fairway, where they can get a lower price for their gas. Remember, they don't care whether they buy gas from Sinclair or Speedway, they just wanna fill up their tank. And so when Sinclair tries to charge this higher price, no one's gonna to go to Sinclair and Sinclair's gonna lose all of its sales and it's gonna sell nothing, which isn't ideal from their perspective because their whole purpose in trying to raise their prices was to increase their sale, their revenues and their profits. And that doesn't work in this competitive market when they raise prices above the market price. Now let's suppose that Sinclair charges a lower price. So they say, well, everyone is charging $2 per gallon. Let me lower my price to $1.90 per gallon to increase my sales. Well, that would happen 
But every driver all of a sudden in the St. Paul area would stop going to all of the stations that are charging $2 per gallon and instead would go to Sinclair. And Sinclair would sell out of gas in, say, the first hour of operation. And then they would just be sitting around because they have nothing to sell for the rest of the day. And so obviously that's not ideal either. And from a revenue perspective, they would be better off charging a higher price and selling out on fuel than they would charging a lower price and selling out on fuel. And so what we would describe this as is that Sinclair is a price taker in the market since it cannot unilaterally charge a price that's different from the market price. And it's not just that they cannot, they physically could. It's just that neither one of these scenarios would work out particularly well for the gas station if they did charge a different price. And so we then say that in a perfectly competitive market, you have many buyers, many sellers, both buyers and sellers are price takers, and they're buying and selling goods that are identical in, in that you don't care what firm you're buying this product from. And that's what characterizes the